Welcome everybody to Pediatric Grand Rounds. We've got a really exciting Grand Rounds today. Uh, just to remind everybody that if you uh, have any questions as we, as we go through the seminar, please use the Q&A um, link rather than the um, chat. And we'll be looking at the questions and uh, going through them as we go along. And so I'd like to turn it over to Sandrine Van Shake to get us started and introduce our speakers for today. Hi, everybody. Welcome to um, Grand Rounds, a special Grand Rounds today, uh, focusing on Q&A projects by our residents. Before I introduce the uh, person who actually coordinates all these efforts and uh, has for many, many years um, done this as a service to our residency in our department. I just wanted to make sure, and I'll repeat this announcement at the end, that you all know that we're heading towards the end of our grand round season uh, with um, uh, two more sessions coming up. And considering everything that's going on at the moment, we decided to change uh, the last session of the year, June 25th, which was scheduled to be about um, how we've done education innovatively in the COVID-19 period. Um, we decided to change that and instead ask uh, Dr. Ria Boyd, who is a pediatrician and activist and a prior UCSF uh, resident, to come speak to us to um, discuss more about her thoughts uh, regarding diversity, equity, inclusion, and where we go from here. We're gonna make that a 90 minute session so that there's a lot of time for question and answers. And we, have, uh, we are co-sponsoring that with the diversity committee from the uh, Benioff Children's Hospital, as well as the residency diversity committee uh, to really allow for some reflection on what we're doing locally as well. So I hope you'll join us uh, for that special session. And with that, I am gonna give this over to um, our main uh, organizer of today's uh, session, uh, Dr. John Takayami. Uh, John is a professor of clinical pediatrics who is the site director for residency continuity clinic at UCSF Mount Zion Pediatric Primary Care. He has collaborated with Dr. Glenn Rosenbluth, who you all know um, as the director of quality and safety programs at UCF, UCSF, to develop an outpatient curriculum focused on quality improvement. He has been involved with QI since um, being volunteered to serve on the NICHQ, which is the National Initiative for Child Health Care Quality Project Advisory Committee in 2001, and recently led an AAPP-sponsored QI collaborative to increase HPV immunization rates among 10 pediatric primary care practices in Northern California. And for those of you who know John, you know um, that he's one of the kindest, most supportive pediatricians our residents could possibly hope for, for. He's done this work for many, many years. And before um, we see the pre resident presentations from this year, he's actually going to give us a quick overview of all the great work that has happened under his leadership uh, over the past few years. John, handing it over to you. Okay. Well, thank you very much uh, for the uh, great introduction. And let's, okay, here we go. Okay, but before we get started, uh, just a, a very important moment. Thank you very much. Uh, and we just wanted to express our solidarity. So today's uh, presentation is actually a resident QI projects. Every year uh, around this time, uh, we get a chance to see what residents were able to do in terms of their QI projects. But this year, things are a little bit different. 
uh, and there was something called a pandemic that happened uh, in the time period where we were just about to get into the meat of the projects. So things did not quite uh, work out as planned, uh, but we still have some great projects that we want to introduce. Uh, so before I get started, just a quick disclosure. Uh, some of us uh, have uh, the fortune of having some disclosures, so I happen to be one of them, but there are no conflicts of interest. So the objectives are to illustrate how residents use QI methods to improve healthcare delivery in clinic settings and to discuss systemic issues identified when conducting quality improvement. And finally, to propose future QI projects in clinic settings to address social concerns. So this is part one. We're gonna look back for the last nine years. Uh, and it, in a sense, this is actually a tribute to uh, Glenn because he has been a part of all of this and actually started all of this. So just a quick um, uh, mention about the Resident Continuity Clinic. We have 41 residents at the Mount Zion site and four residents now at China Basin. Uh, Many of the residents are actually all the residents at the Mount Zion site are part of pods. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, each of those pods have eight residents and at least two faculty preceptors assigned to each of the pods. Uh, there are clerks, MAs, LVNs, nurses, administrators, social workers, so other people who are working at Mount Zion as well as over at China Basin at, at, um, at the China Basin site. Uh, and John Huang is the uh, faculty uh, person at China Basin. So the nine-year retrospective, so really this started on January the 5th, 2011, and I'm not sure if I should feel old or young, uh, but I was pretty much younger in 2011. Um, and this is what Glenn and his group wrote uh, when he first introduced the QI projects uh, to residents and to faculty, uh, that the projects will not only strengthen our competency-based curriculum, but also give residents time to reflect on their clinic panels and the quality of care they provide. And what really moved me uh, was that he was willing to have the projects happen in clinic. So not just in the hospital side, but in clinic. And there are several lessons that we did learn. One was most important, the feasibility part, that we can do QI projects in resident clinic. And the second is that there are some commonalities, which we'll see soon, and some challenges and solutions. Between 2010 and 2019, 26 individual QI projects uh, were done. Uh, and many of them are around screening. So developmental screening at nine and 18 months, uh, depression screening, screening around gun safety, uh, screening about screen time, anemia and lead, secondhand smoke, as well as safety at home in the environment. Some are about counseling and referrals. So not just screening, but what's the next step? Uh, so what do we do if we identify overweight and obesity? How can we uh, connect uh, patients to necessary help? Uh, or what happens if we suspect developmental delay? Some are around management, vitamin D supplementation, or increasing immunization rates. And some of it had to do with our medical records. It was really around 2011 that switched over to uh, uh, APEX and lots of issues at that time. Uh, so we couldn't get all the immunization history into APEX. So we were doing that by hand. And as you can imagine, we still continue to have some issues with problem lists, et cetera. Uh, so that was uh, some of the projects at that time. Uh, clinic flow was, an, was a key issue uh, about five years ago. Uh, distribution of books and counseling, reach on and read, that was more recent, um, as well as more recently, uh, paying attention to access to care. So what happened over time? Uh, so we'll quickly discuss two things that happened. One has to do with the PDSA cycle. Uh, initially, we thought one cycle was sufficient. So here's one example. Screening for firearm safety going from 36% to 59%. Maybe two cycles, and this has to do with the developmental screening, whether it was handed out, that's given, or completed, meaning the parents completed it. Uh, so you see July to December, once again, January to February, and then March to May. 
And then more recently, this has to do with firearm safety screening. Uh, no need to look at the, the fine print, but the main thing is that it's monthly data. So not only going from one PDSA cycle to many, but single pod to multi-pod projects. So these are three pods, Monday, Thursday, Friday, around secondhand smoke a number of years ago, uh, slightly different uh, for each of the pods. And this is more recently, I think this was 2018, to improve um, access to electronic health records, the patient portals, 2017 to 2018. And just you know, some of the uh, things that we did that seem to be associated with increases. Um, and uh, the, the Khan Apex sign up, um, calling out uh, Matt Khan, uh, he, he was able to single-handedly improve this and you can ask him afterwards what he did. And this is uh, last year's Reach Out and Read project. This was not clinic wide, but uh, many of the pods participated. Uh, and here you can see the improvements, especially in the spring. What we learned. So it's really important that we pick a project that people are invested in, that we have champions. So forgetting is always an issue. Uh, it's hard to remember. Uh, some of the uh, interventions take a very short time. Uh, this was an average of one minute, 52 seconds to counsel about minimizing screen time. When you see your own patients, you may be more motivated to uh, do QI. Uh, when positive results are rare, less motivating to keep screening. So that's one of the unfortunate issues around screening. Um, because if you're screening, you're not finding something, that's a good thing, but then for QI purposes, sometimes uh, it can result in less motivation. Change is difficult, if not clinic-wide. And consider integration into APEX, that's a common uh, thought. And trying harder is not a plan. Also, we worried sometimes about asking questions that might be taken negatively by parents, and that didn't happen. But we did realize that sometimes we need to focus not so much on the issue, but on the solution, such as healthy eating. Uh, and we, need more, we needed more help around certain things that we wanted to do, such as motivational interviewing. Uh, we real quickly realized that food insecurity is prevalent in our patient population. Uh, sometimes when residents are away from clinic and they are the champions, things get sort of stalled a little bit. Uh, and we realized the importance of working uh, as a team on the QI projects. Okay, so, um, and here are some of the others, but I'm gonna go quickly to the end. The important to consider demographic factors and social determinants. And this was one of the things that uh, we examined when we did the uh, uh, activation of my chart, which is that there are some populations that were being left behind. And these are people who are on public insurance. So sometimes when we try to improve things, uh, we actually widened healthcare disparities. And in this particular case, and these are just percentages is a much smaller proportion, it doesn't quite match up, but the um, idea is the same, which is that uh, uh, my chart doesn't work if you uh, do not speak English as a um, uh, main language. So summary, so residents learn to use the model for improvement and PDSA cycle to con conduct continuity clinic QI projects. So we're successful there. Uh, we are successful for expanding the cycles to many successful cycles and go from uh, the research p-values to run charts. Residents were able to look at their panel of patients and identify projects to improve quality of care about what they are doing and also work together as a group. I think we made more progress going from single to multi-pod, uh, but that doesn't happen every year for a variety of reasons. Uh, and we're just beginning to reach out to other members of the staff uh, to share in implementing change. Okay, so now we'd like to go to uh, individual resident QI projects during the pandemic. And I, just a reminder that the COVID-19 pandemic did have an impact. It did stall things. Uh, so what I'd like you to do as an audience is to think about the um, the thoughts and rationale that went into the projects themselves, the results, unfortunately, um, were affected by the pandemic. So they are not full results, uh, only partial results or intentions. 
So I, I'd like to now invite uh, Dr. Aditi Dasgupta uh, from the Monday pod to share screen. Okay, can everybody see and um, hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Awesome. So thank you, Dr. Takayama. Um, my name is Aditi. I'm one of the third year residents in the Monday Mount Zion Continuity Clinic pod. And I'm going to share um, the project that we did um, uh, during the pandemic. <laughs> so just want to acknowledge all of my co-residents, um, Dave Blair, Brendan Higgins, Lindsay Hunter Adamson, Melody Lund, Tina Tan, Shannon Chan and Priya Pathak for all of their hard work and for their dedication to their patients. And I wanted to thank our preceptors, Dr. Nolasco and Dr. Posner, who were really great mentors and helped guide us in our project. So our project, we really decided to look at administering fluoride varnish um, to prevent cavities or dental caries in children. And the, um, there's a couple reasons why we chose this project, but one of the main ones is that, um, as I'm sure many of us in pediatrics know, access to pediatric dentistry is, is a really big challenge, especially based on insurance levels. Um, however, um, cavities and dental caries is a really big problem among our patient population and is actually the most common chronic disease of childhood in the US. Um, risk factors for having adult caries are having childhood caries. That's the single greatest risk factor. And um, we do know that they are preventable. And that one way you can do that is by administering fluoride. Um, and so um, the American Academy of Pediatrics actually recommends fluoride varnish be applied in the primary care setting at least once every six months and preferably every three months, starting from when you have your first tooth eruption, which is anywhere from like four months to, you know, um, beyond. So uh, the main risks of fluoride um, use is the development of fluorosis, which is like a little white stain on the teeth, and that is typically dose dependent. And so kind of all of that is the background of, of caries and fluoride. And then um, our clinic, Mount Zion, um, had not been routinely administering um, fluoride varnish for kind of uh, reasons that were due to staffing and, and, and um, expertise. And so last year in 2019, the clinic decided to start applying it at the nine and 15 month visits. Um, and specifically at those visits because there are typically fewer vaccines given at that time and just generally more time for administration of the varnish by the staff. And so our pod wanted to see what was our baseline rate of administration um, and then what could we do to improve it. Oops. So here is our aim statement. So our goal was um, for 100% of nine and 15 month old patients to receive fluoride varnish in our clinic or have a documented dental home because that's another place that when they go to the dentist, they're probably getting um, the varnish. And we were just going to look at the percentage of our patients um, that we saw that received the, the varnish or stated that they had a dental home. And so this is our control data. So um, we looked at basically September uh, or October through November. And during that time, as you can see, the numbers are a little low. We only saw nine patients that met um, the nine and 15 month wild child checks. One of them didn't have any teeth, so we excluded that patient. Um, but of the eight that were included, four of them received varnish in clinic and it went well. Um, of the four that did not, two of them already had a dental home, so that was um, included in our overall total. And then two, we didn't really document why they didn't get the fluoride varnish, so you know there was some room for improvement. So at baseline, 75% of our eligible patients were getting um, the, the varnish. And so we decided that one, one easy intervention that we could do for our first PDSA cycle would be to um, increase understanding and um, awareness about the need for fluoride and how it can prevent caries. And so we distributed this AAP-based handout, which is kind of universally used um, to our families. Um, and hoped that that would kind of augment the understanding. We also discussed with them in the visit why it was important and why we wanted to administer it. 
And so our intervention period was from November 18th to February, and then the pandemic occurred. Um, and during this time period, our pod saw 14 patients that fit this time, uh, that fit the qualifications. One of them didn't have teeth, and 11 got varnish, and one had a dental home. So only one patient didn't get it, and that was because um, a parent kind of said, why should we start this now? We haven't done it before. I don't understand. And so just very basic run chart here, but our pre-intervention and post-intervention data, you see we went from 75% to 92% and our goal is 100%. So kind of conclusions and kind of future directions. Obviously we were hoping to do multiple PDSA cycles. We were limited by the pandemic, um, but we just within one cycle, we're able to show that greater than 90% of the nine and 15 month olds could get fluoride varnish. Um, or at a dental home. We felt that the educational handout may help increase the rate. We saw an improvement. Um, other things are that we were more aware of it, we were recommending it. Um, and for our next steps, you know, I think that just, uh, it would be helpful to have more cycles of this so we could identify what the barriers are to why patients are not receiving it. You know, in our second cycle, we found out that a parent didn't understand why we were introducing something new. So that's an area for improvement. But maybe we could um, post this poster up in the rooms to you know, increase universal awareness or hand it out in the AVS at six months and give parents time to think about it. And then we'd like to recommend to our clinic that if it's possible and that you know, maybe we interview our staff, um, we could potentially administer fluoride varnish more frequently um, to align with AAP recommendations at the 12 and 18 month visits, but that's a separate discussion. So um, that's it for my presentation and thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Dasgupta. And next will be Dr. Powerstein, Phil Powerstein, um, representing the Tuesday pod. Right. Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm representing Tuesday Pod. I'm one of the third year residents. Um, and so our interns and R2s and R3s you can see here. Uh, and we'd like to thank our, our outstanding preceptors, Anna Malano, John Takayama, and Alan Uba for all that they've done for us this year. Um, let's. Oh, can, can everybody see this uh, screen? No. Is it working now? We can see you now, but we still can't see your screen. There mm -hmm. you go, it's coming. It's coming? Yeah, now make it a um, uh, presenter mode or a, a you know, slideshow. Yeah, you got okay. it. Now, you're, now we're good? Okay, sorry about that. Um, so in our clinic pod, we wanted to, if we step back to a time pre-coronavirus pandemic, uh, one of the major issues that was uh, on people's minds in the fall was uh, e-cigarette and vaping use uh, and vaping-induced lung injury. Uh, and so we had a sort of a general sense that we were not screening for, uh, for new versions of nicotine use uh, in a systematic way, uh, and we wanted to improve that so that we could uh, do better by our patients and, um, and identify people who might benefit from, uh, from counseling on the use of nicotine products. Um, in accordance with this, the AAP had recommended routine screening for tobacco use and counseling back in 2011. Uh, and despite that, uh, it seemed like only in, in a study in 2018, only about a third of adolescents had reported being, uh, being screened by their pediatricians for, for use of nicotine. And then with the, with the development and the increasing popularization of vaping and e-cigarettes, uh, we know that how adolescents and how parents use nicotine has, has changed dramatically. Uh, we don't know much about, uh, about secondhand exposure at this point, but we do know that, uh, that poisonings in small children related to, to small children getting access to concentrated nicotine solutions from e-cigarette cartridges are, are more and more common on the order of 10,000 cases since, uh, since the early 2010s. Um, and we also know that, uh, that secondhand smoke exposure has significant effects on developing lungs and, and otherwise. Um, so 
our aim was to increase our screening for nicotine use, including e-cigarette or other nicotine delivery devices um, in both our adolescent visits and in all other ages for parent use. Um, based on our sort of pre-assessment, we had a sense that we weren't doing a very good job of this. And when we looked at chart review, uh, our documentation was, was fairly limited, particularly for, uh, for primary care visits with younger children um, regarding screening of the parents. Uh, it basically approached zero for those patients. Um, so our intervention that we came up with was education within the clinic pod. And so one of our second year residents who has a, an interest in pulmonology and respiratory health, she put together a, a presentation for one of our continuity clinic conferences um, regarding both e-cigarette prevalence and, uh, and negative effects, including vaping induced lung injury. And then one of our, or some of our interns developed smart phrase templates that they could incorporate, that we could all incorporate into our well child check note templates um, to help us to remember and systematically screen for, uh, for secondhand smoke or nicotine exposure in, in our patients. Um, we would do a chart review uh, from, our, from our prior patients over the last four, several months to establish a baseline, and then we would reassess by chart review quarterly um, with multiple PDSA cycles to identify areas that we could improve. Um, unfortunately, the pandemic basically began while we were in the midst of our first cycle, and so we, um, we don't have much data from this, um, but we do know that smoking and vaping will continue to be an issue after the coronavirus passes, um, and we will no doubt want to continue to improve our screening um, in the future. We know that this is something we, at least in our clinic pod, we weren't doing uh, in a particularly systematic way. And so we think that more built-in tools, whether it's, um, it's a built-in smart phrase within our Apex well child check templates or uh, a systematic screening with families by perhaps a handout or something, um, in combination with more resident education around the topic might help to, to improve our, our screening. So that is all I have. Thank you, Dr. Parstein. Um, and uh, so we look forward to the next iteration. Uh, I would like to go next to Dr. Tsui, Stephanie Tsui uh, from China Basin. All right, hello everyone. I am one of the R2s. I will be presenting on pediatric EB utilization that we did at China Basin. It was actually a two year project and we don't have pods, but we do have three residents at any given time. So this is then between Howard, Claire, Matt, and I. Um, so the problem that we saw at China Basin that we identified we wanted to work on was pediatric EB utilization at China Basin is actually consistently higher um, than that at Mount Zion. And so we wanted to decrease the ED utilization rate by 10%. Um, during our first year of this QI project. And then we used the secondary measure that was gonna be the percent difference from Mount Zion. We created a fishbone chart to kind of look and see what our issues might be that we could attack during the QI project. And you can see these are many of the things that um, prevent uh, access to care, both related to the system as well as the patient and the provider. Um, so in further understanding the problem, we did chart reviews um, over a segment of ED visits, and we found 124 in the time period that we chose. Of those, we each looked at the charts and deemed that 59% of them ultimately did not require ER level care. And so with the help of the clinic staff, we reached out to these parents and did survey calls. Um, and you can see here that a lot of it was actually parent anxiety or parent choice that led them to go to the ED that night instead of using another option, although some of it was MD and RN advice. Um, and so by breaking this down even further, we looked into parent anxiety and choice, and that was either convenience or preference. They thought it was an emergency. Um, it was late. They didn't want to wait until morning. And then some of the more actual things is they didn't know there was an after hours advice or clinic. They couldn't get appointment in clinic or they couldn't reach the advice nurse. And so we thought we would um, go with these actionable items. And so our interventions conveniently at this time, China Basin was um, getting more pediatric appointments through uh, new providers. And so we improved access from that point. 
um, although that was not our individual efforts. But in addition, we also increased education about the after hours advice and appointment options, um, added this into the RN advice calls, as well as um, when we were responding to my chart messages or talking to families that were either new at the clinic or at their well child checks just to remind them where they can go if the child is sick. Um, and so here is our run chart. This actually includes the data from the two years of our project, but the first year brings us up into the, about July of 2019. So you can see in the beginning um, to note these are rates per 1,000 per year. The green bar is China Basin and the orange bar is Mount Zion and Mission Bay combined. Um, so the first data here is when we did the chart reviews and the surveys with a percent difference of 16%. And then this is where we did our intervention and you can see that the rate did decrease and we reached our aim by the beginning of about um, this academic year, September of 2019, with a great um, percent difference of only 9% there, so drastically decreased from the 16%. But unfortunately, we saw an uptick the next, in just the next month, and this was the time when we were choosing our QI projects for this year, so we decided to do the same QI project, um, and it was kind of served as a PDSA cycle. Um, so this time, we chose our primary measure to be the percent difference between EB utilization between uh, um, China Basin and Mount Zion, and then the secondary measure to be ED utilization. And so our plan, we chose a segment of ER visits and we did the same chart review, surprisingly 59% of them, which was almost exactly the same as the year before were deemed ultimately did not require ER level care. And of those, a lot of them fell into the parent anxiety and parent choice um, categories. And so our plan was to um, look into parent anxiety and choice and we still saw that there was uh, still this issue of not knowing where to go for after hours advice or clinic. I think it also became apparent to us that China Basin is closer to the Mission Bay campus ED than Mount Zion is, and so this convenience or preference factor may actually apply more to China Basin than Mount Zion. Um, and we are also only looking at ED visits um, specifically to Mission Bay. We cannot control if there were Mount Zion patients or China Basin, Basin patients were going to EDs outside of Mission Bay. So we presented this plan at the True New North Board Leader Rounds to increase patient education about these after hours um, options. And we would have liked to look more into Mount Zion to see um, what they were doing and what was successful about our, their system that was different from ours. But unfortunately, the pandemic happened and our efforts petered out there. Um, but as you can see from the run chart, we did decrease um, the rates, mainly probably due to the pandemic and just overall less EV utilization um, in general and our percent decrease difference was decreased a little bit from 14% to 13%. Um, so lessons learned, we learned that local interventions can make a difference, but it's definitely hard to do. There's many contributing factors, only some of which we can control. Um, QI is an imperfect science, but it's a great tool for engaging all of the clinic staff, and a lot of the clinic staff was really helpful in this project. Um, and I'll end by saying thanks to Dr. Rong for leading us in these efforts. Dr. Tsui, thank you very much, uh, and uh, a two-year uh, pr persistence. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to now go to Dr. Claire Gibson, who will be presenting the uh, Wednesday pod at Mount Zion. All right, I don't know. Okay, sorry about that. I got Charisse to let me in here, perfect. So let me get us started. Um, my name is Claire Gibson and I'm one of the R3s in the Wednesday pod and I have the great honor of representing these fine doctors who have really become a family to me over the last three years. So I'm pleased to be here today. We decided actually to hitch our wagon to Monday Pod, and Dr. Desgupta gave you a great uh, context for the importance of fluoride administration, so I'm going to try to keep it brief today. Our aim, similar to Monday Pod, was to increase the proportion of the children we were seeing in our pod for nine and 15 month old well child visits who were receiving fluoride varnish. Um, and we really hoped to harness the momentum in the Mount Zion Clinic in general, since this was an effort that was, that was underway anyway. As Aditi mentioned, uh, the US Preventative Task Force 
uh, has made a recommendation and AAP has backed that, that, that primary pediatricians serve as a way to administer fluoride varnish um, in those early, early months and years of a child's life, especially given the challenge of establishing a dental home after the eruption of the first tooth. And fluoride is a safe and simple intervention to protect, protect against dental caries. And in that sense, we as a clinic pod and as primary pediatricians are well positioned to, uh, to do that work. We, as a way of baseline data collection, and I'll show this on the next slide in a graph, reviewed from August to about October, November, how many patients we had seen who were either nine months old or 15 months old for a well child check, and looked in our note documentation to see if we had either offered fluoride, given fluoride, or not mentioned <laughs> fluoride at all. And I'll show you that baseline data and then worked to improve from there over the next couple of months. The changes we made to try to increase our, our awareness of the project was to have written reminders on computer screens and doors. Uh, we worked as a pod at the beginning of our afternoons together to identify whether any of us had nine or 15 month old visits and use that to cue each other verbally as uh, reminders to think about fluoride. And then perhaps most helpful, um, this was a, a Mount Zion-wide effort, fluoride um, administration got incorporated into many of our note templates that we use commonly to serve as that visual reminder when we were in the clinic rooms. And our APEX order sets for nine and 15 month old uh, visits now incorporate uh, fluoride varnish as an easy option for us. Perhaps most importantly though, and I'll say anecdotally, this was important to me, we work to educate ourselves as a pod about the, the kind of dental health of our young patients. And Aditi showed you this wonderful kind of infographic that the AAP has designed. We too gave these info sheets to our patients. And I love their slogan here, I like my teeth.org. Simple one for any of you wanting to look up more information after this talk. Um, we really work to think about and talk about as a pod why fluoride was important, why the varnish specifically was important, but then why also using a fluoride containing toothpaste was helpful to to our patients as well. So I think in general, though this isn't captured in our data in a robust way, we all began to talk more about dental health in our, in our primary visits. Here's just a rough, um, rough layout of our data that we were able to collect before COVID interrupted our, uh, <laughs> our ability to be in clinic on a regular basis. You can see in August, we saw seven patients who were either nine or 15 months old and did not uh, talk about or administer fluoride varnish to any of them. Similarly in September too. And then you can see um, how things started to change after we began to talk about fluoride. It was incorporated in our APEX sets. And you can see that in December, actually six out of seven patients who were nine or 15 months actually got their fluoride varnish. So I think you can see the spirit of the QI project in this, even though our pod's um, ability to do another PDSA cycle and really dig into what the best intervention was, was interrupted by the pandemic. Lessons learned, as I mentioned, educating ourselves about um, fluoride was one of the biggest pieces. Uh, if shelter in place had not interrupted our QI project, I think what our next step would have been was to focus in on kind of exactly what intervention to, to use and, and continue to study going forward. And then just a note, um, one of the things that was interesting as we were looking through our data is to see when outside factors do play a role in how many kids get fluoride. For example, our staffing was limited on November 13th, and so a number of children who we talked to fluoride about weren't able to get fluoride varnish. So um, I'll pause there, but thank you so much. It, it was a great, even though, even though our world has changed dramatically since we picked this project, it's been a great learning experience for us and I think it's really gonna change our clinical practice. Thank you very much, Dr. Gibson. Um, I would like to now go to Dr. Gabe Devlin and Dr. Becca Alvida of the Thursday pod. Thank you, Dr. Takayama. And if the co-host can help uh, restart my video, please. And I'm going to share my uh, screen. Okay. All right, 
Great, thank you. Um, okay, so um, I'm Beth Olveda. Um, I'm in the Thursday pod. And I'm going to be co-presenting this um, presentation with um, Dr. Gabe Deflin, who's my, in my pod as well. Um, so our pod is uh, was focused on reducing disparities in vaccination rates, and then also in general, um, looking at trying to increase vaccination rates among our two-year-old population, which we'll talk more about. Um, and I just wanted to acknowledge um, all the wonderful people in my pod. So. Um, in addition to Gabe, uh, also Cassidy Mellon, Caitlin Royce, Sam Corman, Ariel White, Gabby Chateau, Manny Gonzalez, and Faustine Ramirez. So um, our, um, our pod basically looked at the fact that only about half of our Mount Zion patients complete their two-year vaccination bundle. And um, as we're all familiar with, this is um, quite a critical time for vaccinations. Um, in the At the two-year age range, there's just so many of our most critical vaccines um, are completed by that time, and I've, they're all listed all there. Um, and then we also found at the beginning of our study that um, about there's about a 10 to 15 percent lower rate of completion among black patients, Latino patients, and then publicly insured patients. So our aims were um, by June 1st of this year to increase our two-year-old vaccination bundle completion rate um, from 50 to 80% for all of our patients. And then in addition to eliminate the disparities that we saw at the beginning of our study between um, Black and Latino families, um, between uh, those families and other racial and ethnic groups, and then um, as well as to eliminate the disparity between publicly insured families and privately insured families. And so what did we do? So we started off with um, creating an EPIC report and I'd like to give credit to Dr. Sabrina Fernandez who helped us generate this report. It automatically identified um, two-year-old children um, and below um, who were under-vaccinated um, in our Thursday pod, who had a Thursday pod PCP. Um, we did include children who were as young as 18 months old who would have um, aged into the two-year age range with it during our um, study period. Um, and to, in order to kind of proactively identify them and um, schedule their visits ahead of time. Uh, we also included past generations of graduated Thursday pod residents and then redistributed their patients to the interns just because by that point, um, the interns um, themselves may not have had um, many um, children who were, they were assigned to be the PCP. Um, and then each resident was assigned about three to 10 patients of their own to follow up on. Um, so this is an example of the um, report that was generated by EPIC. Um, you can see it identifies who the PCP is, um, when their next immunizations are, are due, um, their uh, racial and ethnic groups, um, and then which type of insurance that they have, if it's public or um, private. Um, so then after that, um, we created a decision tree, a script to use, um, to, and I'll show you an example of that. Uh, of this decision tree, um, a script to use to reach out to the families, and then letter templates as well, um, if not able to reach out to families by phone, um, to try to call um, these families and schedule either well child visits or just nursing visits if they just needed to um, get up to date on their vaccines. Um, and then the um, senior residents sent a bi-weekly email to our pod to remind them of their patients and then track, um, track progress as well. So this is an, is an example of an uh, email sent by Gabe, um, kind of has this decision tree, what should I do? Look up your patients, see what vaccines they're missing. Secondly, call the family, see if they can come in. Um, Gabe created this script um, and then um, try sending them in my chart. If calling didn't work, in my chart, um, either if they didn't have my chart set up um, or they didn't respond, then try sending them a letter. And then we kind of um, prioritize different patients, which we'll talk a little bit more about as well. Uh, and then there's just an example there of um, kind of residents with their um, individual patients listed. And then I think I'll turn it over now to um, Gabe to go ahead and take over from this part of the presentation. Great. So um, when we uh, so we tracked our progress over time, and we saw a nice slow steady increase in terms of uh, the uptake of the two-year vaccine bundle. Um, in terms of the entire bundle, including flu, we saw an inc improvement from 40% uh, to 71%. And uh, excluding the flu, it went up from 62% to 95%. Um, and, then, and this is for about a, a total of 71 patients over the course of the entire project. 
Um, on the next slide, we, um, we, we can um, see the breakdown by race, ethnicity, and also by insurance. Um, so an interesting thing that came up was that um, when we looked at preliminary data, we saw a pretty clear disparity between uh, Black and Latino patients compared to other ethnicities of about 10 points. But when we started actually looking at intervention data, we didn't see this disparity to be as, it wasn't as obvious. Uh, for example, if you look at the uh, bottom left graph, the, our white patients actually had the lowest uptake of the uh, two-year vaccine bundle, excluding flu. Um, and looking at the um, changes over time, it is possible that what happened was that um, what we were noting in our pre-intervention data was just variation or like random error rather than any significant differences because we were dealing with a very small sample size. Um, where there was a very clear disparity was between uh, publicly insured and privately insured patients. And um, it seemed like over time, our, that disparity only got larger. Um, it seems like a lot of that disparity, if you look at the bottom right graph, is accounted for by the flu vaccine, um, although there's still about a disparity of about 10% between those two groups. Um, on the next slide, uh, we talk a little bit about some of the reasons that were driving change in those numbers over time. Um, so the graph on the left talks about some of the reasons, and about 40% of that change was driven by patients who had transferred out. And by that, I mean, uh, patients who, upon chart review, had not been seen in Thursday pod for many years, and when we followed up with them or by reviewing their charts, it became clear that these were patients that had transferred their care elsewhere and just the PCP and EPIC had not been updated. Um, and so when we called them, it had been clear that they moved to Oregon or some other state or had transferred their care elsewhere. And so that was a, a large driver of our numbers. However, there was a significant portion of patients who um, we were under vaccinated and we were able to vaccinate them or patients who were able to proactively get them updated on the two-year bundle. Um, so the uh, light green in that pie chart are patients who were vaccinated before they turned two years old and then they turned in, turn and they had five, their, to follow, turn over or five, case to follow. And then they were included into our numbers. Um, the dark green were patients who were over two years old at the time of the start of the project and were vaccinated. Um, and the dark blue, the 13% were patients who were vaccinated and then they transferred their care into the pod. Uh, the pie chart on the right side shows some of the reasons among the patients who remained under vaccinated at the time of the end of the project. And it seems like a pretty diverse number of reasons. Uh, the, there were about a third of patients who had expressed some kind of hesitancy towards vaccines. So either they were refusing vaccines in general in 15% or only declining the flu shot in 25%. Um, the remainder of patients were um, either patients who we had not been able to contact, we tried the contact, but we couldn't reach them, or we were able to contact them and schedule an appointment for them, but they were not able to come to the appointment. And then there was a small portion of patients who had received the first uh, flu vaccine, but who needed a booster shot, and they were not able to get that second booster shot. And so on the next slide, uh, we talked a little bit about the future direction. So we... Um, did our first cycle and we ended that in about February, we reviewed uh, preliminary data that was very similar to the data we're showing here that showed that uh, there was a general improvement across the board, um, but that there was still really a very large disparity between Medicaid and uh, privately insured patients. Um, and that also there was just frankly a lot of patients who we probably weren't gonna be able to convince to become up to date on vaccines. So we decided to really focus on efforts on one patients who are most likely to come back to complete vaccines, for example, patients who are only missing their second flu shot um, as well as really to prioritize certain patients like Medicaid patients. And so that way we could really prioritize our efforts um, on those patients because, uh, you know, a residents being very busy, um, I think could only really have the bandwidth to do a couple of phone calls a month at most and really trying to prioritize our efforts on the patients who are the most vulnerable. Um, and what we did is that we started highlighting those patients in red in our emails. Um, we talked a little bit with admin staff at the time as well as how to automate the emails. The emails were being written by hand based on the re report, but a lot of this is based on EMR data. So it could probably be done by computer, but then COVID hit two weeks later, so that got put on hold. But uh, we think that you know we had a lot of good progress with this project, and especially given a lot of the reports, given concerns that many children will be under vaccinated in the setting of shelter in place, we think this is an important project moving forward um, in the coming months. And that's about it. I'd like to thank everybody for their attention and time. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Devlin, Dr. Alveda. And we'll now go to Dr. Danielle Nahal of the Friday pod. Oh, oops. Um. All right, uh, hello everybody. Um, you can hear me. Um, so I'm Danielle. I'm a PZR2 in the Friday pod um, with uh, several other excellent folks you can see there. And we focus our project around screening, improving screening for postpartum depression. Next slide, please. So essentially, you know, defining the problem, these are the kind of things we're looking out for in those first few visits after a baby is born. Um, so we try to draw a clear distinction between kind of what is understood to be a normal kind of transitional coping phase where mothers may have symptoms that are consistent with depression, but are mild, self-limited, and usually resolve within a couple of days um, and don't lead to the same kind of outcomes as true uh, postpartum depression, which is, while not a separate entity in the DSM-5 um, as its own thing, but usually um, patients are identified for having features of depressed mood, the kind of other things we typically screen for, like along like the Siggy Caps mnemonic um, with association of recent um, pregnancy. Uh, next slide. So just kind of broadly speaking at like why this is important and why we do it. Uh, so the AAP re had their uh, recent report from the Committee of on Psychosocial Aspects of Child and Family Health, um, noting that perinatal depression is really common and is in 15, 20% of new mothers. It can lead to really huge challenges for families and mothers themselves and lead to long-term outcomes within our kids that we're seeing. And that most importantly is that most of these patients, many of these patients um, are not identified and just kind of go on um, dealing with it without the supports that we can offer them. So that is why we screen. Um, next slide, please. So the Edinburgh scale is what we currently use at Mount Zion to screen moms for postnatal, for postnatal depression. Um, then it was developed a fair while ago, um, but is still, I think, used for mainly it has a very like open-ended, non-judgmental approach to a lot of the uh, concerns that new parents might find themselves in. Um, the next slide has the questions on it, um, which I think does a good job of kind of framing that these are problems that a lot of people face and that almost everybody is seeing them some percent of the time and we're trying to connect them to supports and see how much they're being impacted. Um, next slide, please. So the reason this, we had a lot of different ideas for QI projects, um, but this came up as one particular thing because we realized we seem to be under screening from our best recollections, we were consistently doing administering the Edinburgh to new moms at the two week visits, the one month visits and the two month visits. But the AAP does recommend that we also screen at the four and six month well child visits, which we as residents were pretty, I think often surprised to hear because we didn't really feel like we were doing that. Um, and that, you know, knowing that like, there is enough prevalence and enough uh, concern that we needed to continue to screen farther out was a really good wake up call for us. Uh, next slide, please. So our plan essentially was to um, first look at rates of um, screening with the Edinburgh prior to our project and then compare them to rates after initiating this. Um, our main intervention was, was kind of grounded around just having renewed attention on those um, early visits, the like, you know, two week, one month, um, two, four, six months, um, have our attendings also help identify which patients on a different day would need screening. And because we rely so much on, you know, when a patient is roomed that like they kind of come with the appropriate paperwork, we ourselves uh, tried to mobilize to like have the envelope ready, have a sticker on it and be ready to kind of talk through it. Um, so, and then each resident ourselves were responsible for like entering our pre-screening data and our interventions afterwards. Our next slide, please. So these are our results. Um, so we really, I would say methodically started screening in like uh, October, November of 2019. And we actually 
made a substantial difference into getting to our, our goal was really 100% of patients who should be screened were screened. Um, I think this goes a lot towards like, again, our preceptors who were um, very focused on making sure that we were all flagging those patients and talking about them. And yeah, did, I would say pretty well. And then as every presentation has hit, um, our, with the onset of the pandemic, and really in this particular case, because this was focused on resident-led screening, um, as our just clinic participation came down, as did our screening rates, which uh, is nicely illustrated. Uh, next slide, please. But we did manage to screen quite a number of babies and or try a number of uh, mothers, and so we, you know, screened seventy six percent of the patients who we in, who should have been screened um, and did have several positive. Um, and you know, talking about again like the importance of screening later on um, and not just at those like early early visits, we did see that a good 20% of our positive screens were past that two month age when that has kind of, for some of us, it was lower on our radar to be talking about. Uh, next slide. So that's kind of everything. Um, I think a lot of the barriers to doing resident QA have already been talked about, essentially, and of course, during a pandemic when we have many more forces acting on us. And so our takeaway was that we can and certainly should be screening um, up to age six months uh, because there are patients that we picked up mm -hmm. and we have a relatively straightforward way to intervene. Thank you. So at this point, I wanted to invite Dr. Glenn Rosenbluth, who's the Director of Quality and Safety Programs, uh, to um, comment uh, on the resident projects. Thanks very much. And this just kind of blows me away. I'm, I'm so amazed by the work that the residents and the faculty in primary care have done and how much the program has really grown from when um, Liz Hansen, who was one of our chief residents, came to me with this idea of, can we do primary care? Can we make sure, or can we do quality improvement in primary care? And um, started the train the trainer and um, it's just grown tremendously under the leadership of John and all the tremendous faculty in the clinics who are doing the frontline work. Um, and personally, I'm reminded of just how much amazing work is done in primary care and how many things there are to remember in the primary care clinics, how many different opportunities to screen and intervene to improve child health. Um, so a few quick points that I just picked up on listening to the talks. Um, firstly, just a reminder that the residents are far and away our most effective change makers. Um, the residents are not wedded to routines. They ask great questions and then they answer those questions with data, um, moving much faster than most of the faculty and staff, and that's fantastic to see. They're using much more sophisticated methodologies in their quality improvement when we started doing just pre-post and now we're seeing multiple tests of change and Ishikawa cause and effect diagrams and annotated run charts and, and um, um, really great work. Um, and in particular, improving care for the patients that they have ownership of, which, which I think I imagine is in incredibly fulfilling as a primary care provider. Um, and then the final thing that I want to um, highlight that, that I think is critically important that um, John commented on and as well as some of the other groups is this recognition that as we do quality improvement and performance improvement, there, there's a difference between improving care for all of our patients and recognizing um, that some patients may need those improvements more than others and being careful to not exacerbate healthcare disparities when we um, implement improvements. There's that saying that a rising tide lifts all boats, and that's wonderful to improve care for everyone, but we really, now that we have much better data, want to keep an eye on um, not exacerbating disparities and, in fact, closing the disparities, so giving that, that improvement work, focusing on those who need it most. So I really appreciate the groups highlighting that and the, the tremendous work. So thank you all for the work you've done, and especially, John, for your leadership. Thank you. Um, Sandrine, do, are there any questions from the audience? Um, there are a few 
a couple of questions, John, but I want to be respectful of, uh, of everybody's time. So before we um, uh, add it, uh, go to questions and for people who have time to um, stay on for those, please do so. I wanted to give Dr. Hirsch uh, an opportunity to say uh, any concluding words. Dr. Hirsch. Yeah, yes. Sorry, I was uh, I was somehow locked out for a moment. But um, thank you, Sandra, and I, I want to thank uh, all the residents for some really fantastic uh, presentations, and John as well for helping uh, oversee and organize this. And uh, Glenn, thank you for your comments as well. Um, so uh, anybody, as, as Sandra said, I need to get off, but whoever wants to stay on and, and uh, continue for a little while, that's great. Uh, and uh, I'll turn it over to Sundre. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hirsch. And for those of you who are um, uh, uh, have to leave just very quickly, we have two more grand rounds. Uh, next week we hear actually from a parent of a patient uh, with uh, 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 chronic disease about the family perspective of living with chronic disease. And then the week after, Dr. Ria Boyd, who is a prior UCSF resident, will come back to discuss uh, issues of race, policing, and how we go from here um, with the group. And that will be an extended grand round, so look for your email. Uh, we do have a couple questions in the um, Q&A. Uh, one is about uh, uh, smoking and vaping. And the question is, what has been done to better decrease smoking and vaping by a policy, legislation, and restriction requirements? Yes, I think that's a great question. Um, our focus in our quality improvement project was on what we could do in the clinic, uh, sort of on a, a more one-to-one -one basis. But uh, there are a few po policies that have been enacted at the federal and the city levels uh, recently that have affected um, child health around vaping and e-cigarette exposure. So uh, the federal government in 2016 required that all um, all e-cigarette fluid packaging be child-proofed, and so that um, that's led to a decrease. The data that I saw was that there was a 20% decrease from um, when the first state policies went in, into action, uh, and that was around 20, 2015, 2016. And so I would imagine that that's now that that's a nationwide requirement. We've seen a substantially larger decrease in pediatric exposures to e-cigarette fluid ingestion. Um, and then the city of San Francisco, as I think many people are aware, initially banned flavored e-cigarette uh, packs to sort of discourage younger users and has now, as of this year, started to enact a, a total ban on e-cigarette sales. And so I think it'll be interesting to see how that affects um, adult and teen use of e-cigarettes. Thank you. Um, and then the other question is, what about better formal connections between pediatricians and prenatal care providers um, in regards to perinatal depression? So different presentation that this is responding to. Formal policy by insurance and training facilities. Um, thanks for the question. Um, I think there are efforts underway to better connect the pediatric residents and the OB residents. I can shout out Claire Gibson and her work um, in centering pregnancy with addressing exactly that, like creating continuity in groups like across providers. Um, I think, unfortunately, we that relationship is still limited in its current state in the outpatient world. We have several, we do have several community resources um, available that we know from our work with the ob team, but I think uh, communication across like getting messages to primary providers is still pretty limited in, in my personal experience, um, but certainly a way, a way forward. Thank you. Um, okay, you get a follow-up questions, uh, and I th think this is a follow-up question for uh, Dr. Powerstein. Um, I know what policies, policies the government has done, so, but do pediatricians and residents have a role in policy development and response? So yeah, I think we do have a role, um, and I think that, uh, that the AAP has been a, a vocal advocate and 
favor of restrictions around e-cigarettes. Um, and then I know that people within our uh, within our institution and within our program have you know have been part of the advocacy around um, around policy measures to help with child health. Um, so I'm in favor of that. I think that our for our quality improvement project in our clinic, it wasn't necessarily uh, what we did in mind in terms of enacting. Thank you. John, I'll hand it over to you. Yes, yeah, so just a, you know, more of a general question that I wanted to answer, uh, which is that advocacy is critically important in all of this, and I think we are heading that way. Uh, there are plenty of venues for that to happen. Um, UCSF residents, uh, faculty, fellows are very involved in the advocacy arena uh, on behalf of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, we also have an advocacy conference coming up, I think, in September uh, that's um, uh, sponsored by the Advocacy Committee uh, of the AAP Northern California chapter, uh, many of whom actually are um, associated with UCSF. Uh, so we're 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 definitely getting there. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's specific to uh, Peter. Uh, any help would be greatly appreciated. So thank you for raising that. I think that was all the questions on the Q and A. So um, I would like to thank you all again for your fantastic presentations and. John, for your leadership and getting everybody organized, and Glenn for uh, providing your input and uh, insights into all of this. And uh, um, we will see each other hopefully soon over Zoom or in person. <laughs>